Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lahri Desai and uh, this is a lecture on panoramic radiography. Uh, the topic is divided into two lectures and this is the part one of the lecture series. The learning outcomes would be divided into the introduction and principle and technique to illustrate the principle, um, advantages and disadvantages of panoramic radiography, anatomy, normal anatomy of panoramic radiography, and uh, to understand and interpret the images, also to detect gross pathology as well as errors in panoramic radiography. The term panorama means a wide angle view of any physical space. So what you can see here is a wide view of a city and the city happens to be Penang. So the term panoramic radiography is applied to the panoramic or the wide view of all the teeth together in one radiograph. So that is the biggest advantage of this radiograph. And the other term that was initially used is the orthopantomograph or OPG, which is still used um, and very commonly to refer to as the same uh, panoramic radiograph. A little bit about how the panoramic radiograph came about into existence was when um, uh, Dr. Y.B. Patero, who is considered the father of panoramic radiography, in 1946 described slit beam method and called it parabolography. Uh, here you can see him trying to make the patient sit on what looks like a dental chair and rotating around the patient with the x-ray machine to get the um, entire arch of teeth. Also around the same time Dr. Numata from Japan was the first to take panoramic radiograph of teeth. He used long curved film placed lingually to teeth and x-ray source and rotated around the patient's head. So essentially both of them had given out similar kind of principle but uh, you would have to actually place the film inside the mouth and somebody had to hold the source and move around the patient. So from there on the panoramic radiograph has come a long way. If you look at the evolution in 1952 to 1960, you see that it's still a chair with the x-ray machine and, um, uh, you know, uh, having to rotate around the patient or probably a mechanism where the intraoral x-ray machine could probably rotate around the patient. But it's taken around 30 to 3 decades to 4 decades to actually come to this stage where we are, where we're using a digital panoramic machine. And this is still 2002, and we've evolved beyond that. <clears throat> so the extraoral imaging, it, it is a method of extraoral imaging, and essentially we use digital imaging. Now, panoramic radiography was film-based imaging, um, and most of the places we've done away with film-based imaging and moved on to digital imaging. So you still have the x-ray source, which I have pointed out in this picture here. You still have the digital sensor to capture the image. So you notice that the patient is in the center of the source and the sensor. Patient is wearing a protective lead apron. And that is a bite block on which the patient bites to stabilize uh, um, himself in the center of the rotation. And you have software to view the image. So you need multiple things to actually bring about a panoramic image that you see on the screen there on the computer. Coming to the most important aspect, which is the principle of panoramic radiography. Now, in order to see the arch as a flattened structure, you must understand that in nature, actually our arch doesn't exactly exist like a flattened structure. It's a horseshoe shaped or a semicircular structure, the jaws, the maxilla and the mandible I'm talking about. So it's important that if you want to look at it as a section, only that area which has the teeth, you would have to apply a principle called as tomography. Tomography means to body section radiography. You must be wondering why is there a picture of a loaf of bread here? It's just to signify that but what we mean by body section tomography is that if this entire loaf of bread is your head and neck region, 
your the x-ray machine is able to slice out slices of bread and able to show you one particular slice clearly which is the maxillofacial area or your dentofacial area area of your dentition so in order to do that it's important that your dentition lies exactly in this imaginary line called as focal trough we'll discuss more about this as we go ahead so it is based on the principle of reciprocal movement of the x-ray source and the image receptor around the central point or plane in which the object of interest is located so if your teeth upper and lower are located in one particular point of interest or, or the area which is which i am talking about the x-ray machine and the receptor are moving let's say in clockwise direction reciprocally at the same time capturing multiple images and x-ray machine is shooting multiple x-rays and the receptor is capturing multiple uh, images as it moves along the head so essentially both the x-ray machine and the receptor move along the head of the patient well the patient is stationary so there are some key terms that i would be using during this lecture first of all is digital imaging so you have understood it that is there you have a source and a digital sensor sensors where you capture the image i will be talking about tomography which is body section radiography focal trough it is a three dimensional curved zone where the structures lying within this layer are reasonably well defined on the final panoramic image the term superimposition because there is going to be some overlap of structures which you see on the panoramic image ghost images shadows of objects located between the x-ray source and center of rotation that get exposed twice now all of these terms might seem overwhelming but they are quite simple to understand so let's look at focal trough again like i told you it's a three dimensional imaginary layer in which you want your patient's jaw to be positioned so this is exactly a description of how that layer looks like that three dimensional layer and when your patient's jaw is positioned at that point and you have uh, taken into consideration the frankfurt plane and and the uh, you know uh, <clears throat> mid sagittal uh, plane for which there are guidelines in the x-ray machine itself you are going to get the best quality of images possible so um most of the time the patient is in all cases the patient is stationary so if you consider the jaw as a structure that is stationary then for the x-ray machine to rotate around the patient and for the film or your sensor to rotate around the patient you would require a center of rotation so in earlier machines they used to be one or two centers of rotations but the imaging right now utilizes multiple centers of rotation along in curved area along which the x-ray machine and the receptor move about and hence you're able to cover this horseshoe shaped structure reasonably clearly so that's what i'm talking about the x-ray machine moves around the uh, jaw you have multiple centers of rotation along which the x-ray source moves and the image is captured so it's a moving center of rotation so this again helps you understand that the direction of the x-ray source around the patient and the direction of the receptor are actually either clockwise or anticlockwise and they move reciprocally reciprocally together at the same speed so if you were to look at modern panoramic machines the shape of the image layer uh by using moving centers of rotation and by varying the relative receptor is able to capture multiple um you know images and put them together let's look at this again so it varies the position of the x-ray machine as well as the receptor to get the image
So the X-ray machine acquires the image in stages. You will see based on this picture here that you it first covers one part of the jaw and then moves on to take multiple images to actually combine it and make the entire jaw look flattened. So the final image looks something like this. Your jaw is flattened out from one corner of the TMJ to the other corner of the TMJ and you can see all four quadrants clearly in one image. So just to look back at the focal trough again is a three-dimensional curved zone where structures lying within this layer are reasonably well defined on the final panoramic image. I hope you must have understood what I'm talking about. So <coughs> what if the teeth don't lie within the image? What happens? So this diagrams showing the vertical walls of the focal trough in the incisal region and the relative position of the teeth with different underlying dental and skeletal and uh, abnormalities. What we mean by that is picture A is you have, if you have ideal occlusion and both your incisors are actually lying within the focal trough. What if you have proclined incisors? Or what if you have your, um, you know, lower incisors sit far away inside? So you would notice that these blue areas are the areas which get blurred or don't get covered. So the blue parts of the teeth lie outside the focal trough and will be blurred and out of focus on the final image. So that is what the importance of the focal trough is, which makes you understand that it's important that you manually make the patient position them within the area or the confines of the focal trough in the x-ray machine. Now this is something which we can show you when we are actually showing you the x-ray machine and the positioning and may be a little difficult for you to comprehend if you are listening to this lecture for the first time. <laughs> right, so like I told you, you need to ask the patient to bite in the bite block and the jaw has to be positioned in the focal trough region. So what happens when the position of the focal trough is exactly at the center. So like they, this is an experiment in uh, White and Farrow, your radiology textbook, where they've used a metal ring in the center of the incisal area and imaged it, placing the jaw exactly in the center of the focal trough. You see that the ring you see ex is exactly rounded and has no distortion. But if the jaw is away from the focal trough, then you see horizontal magnification of this ring and the teeth look broadened and fattened out. And if the jaw is positioned way too forward in the focal trough, you see that there is minimization or narrowing of the ring, which in, and the teeth also become thinned out or narrowed out. So that is the critical uh, importance of the focal trough and of patient positioning in a panoramic radiograph. Now, <clears throat> we come to the important part of interpreting panoramic radiographs. For this, it's important that you have a quiet viewing room and appropriate ambient lighting. That is true for any digital image, in fact. There are certain concepts you need to keep in mind when you're interpreting panoramic images. First of all, the structures are flattened and spread out. Uh, like I just showed you in the previous image. And the midline structures may project as single images and double images. So the image of the heart palate, palatine torus, body of the hyoid or epiglottis, all of these are midline structures. So they might get exposed once or twice during the rotation of the image uh, receptor as well as the x-ray machine and end up getting uh, double imaged. So this is what I was talking about as superimpositions, which we will look at in detail when we're looking at the image. Also, ghost images are formed. Let's look at this interesting part also a little later on. Soft tissue outlines are seen, air spaces are seen, and relative radiolucencies and radio opacities are seen. All in all, panoramic radiographs are unique. So there are some tips to look through a panoramic image when you're looking at a flattened out uh, image of your teeth. 
Number one is to divide this panoramic image into nine segments for ease of uh, diagnosis and so that you do not miss out any of the findings. And move on from the first part to the second, third, fourth, fifth, which is the area of where the uh, dentition is, sixth, seventh, eighth, and then towards the ninth. So essentially your eyes are scanning through from one corner of the image to the other corner of the image in, in a pattern, in a grid pattern where you've divided it um, <clears throat> into nine segments. So if you were to look at the basic anatomy of uh, panoramic images, there are mandibular landmarks, maxillary landmarks, and a lot of other shadows. So it's important to understand that you already have a basic knowledge of uh, anatomy and then we build on that knowledge. So I will just pen out few of the most important areas of the landmark, starting from the corner which I had mentioned. So we'll start off with maxillary landmarks. So this is your zygomatic process. You have the lower border of the eye or the orbit maxillary sinus here, floor of the maxillary sinus, nasal septum, you have the anterior nasal spine here, intermaxillary suture, sorry that went a bit off the midline, you have the heart palate, this is the entire shadow of the heart palate, this way, this is the heart palate, right, and then you have the maxillary tuberosity region, and yes, that's about most of the important parts that you need to know in the maxillary sinus. Yeah, and these are the lateral walls of the uh, maxillary sinus. So those are your maxillary landmarks. And if you were to look at, um, let's change the color here, mandibular landmarks. Start off with the... Uh, the condyle, the condylar neck, this is the condylar head of the TMJ, you have the sigmoid notch and then let's compare it on the other side, you have the coronoid process, right, and this is the external uh, oblique uh, ridge which is coming all the way here, uh, you have the lingular area of the mandible, the entire mandible canal can be traced out, um, there you go, and then you have the um, mental foramen. Uh, you can see the lingual foramen here, which is quite difficult to see on panoramic radiographs. Yeah, and, and that's about it. You have a beautiful mandibular landmarks. Also, this is called as the uh, gonial angle or the angle of the mandible. <clears throat> other than that, you have other uh, shadows, like for example, this is the shadow of the year. Uh, you have, you can see the uh, vertebrae very clearly. These are the cervical spine um, vertebrae. This is your hyoid bone, right? So um, there are more shadows that are visible, but these are the most, some of the most important ones. Oh yes, and this is the styloid process. So most of the landmarks that we just covered and I was talking about are here, both maxillary and mandibular. And, and you need to keep understanding and looking at all panoramic radiographs to understand that they, all of these anatomical landmarks would be present in any panoramic radiograph. And it's about important that you delineate the difference between the anatomical landmark and the uh, uh, pathology or a finding. Right. Now, let's look at some of the, uh, in detail, the mandibular structures. This is a picture that I've borrowed from the internet. You're able to see, like we told you, the condyle, the neck, sigmoid notch, coronoid process, a ramus, inferior dental canal, that is your mandibular canal, okay, angle of the mandible, body of the mandible, mental foramen, symphysis menti, and the external oblique ridge. Coming to the maxilla, there's a lot more complicated overlap and superimposition of uh, a lot of anatomical landmarks here. 
you can see the pterygoid, uh, pterygopalatine fossa, it's like a teardrop shaped structure here, pterygoid plates over here, external auditory canal, that is your ear canal, zygomatic arch, which is shown in yellow, a lateral wall of the maxilla, this entire thing, your maxillary bone, zygomatic buttress, somewhere here, uh, the, the dashed line, and inferior wall of the uh, maxilla, I would say this is the maxillary sinus floor as well, and uh, hard palate, and of course the inferior concha, which is inside your nose. Surrounding structures are articular eminence. Yes, of course, of this belongs to your maxilla and located in front of your temporomandibular joint. Glenoid fossa, anterior arch of the uh, first cervical vertebra, styloid process, a body of the dens or the second vertebra, and the hyoid bone. These are some air shadows which you should see and all of these again superimpose over the panoramic structure. You have soft tissue shadows as well as air shadows. You have the uh, <clears throat> nasal cavity uh, and the nasopharynx here. The nasal cavity superimposing over the entire area. You have the nasopharynx. Um, you have oropharynx way down below um, basically your windpipe and your food pipe you have the glossopharynx that means the gap between the tongue and your palate and external auditory canal you also have soft tissue structure superimposing like the entire soft palate just behind your heart palate superimposing over the area whole of the tongue is also there but it's just blurred out because i told you we are not covering anything that is not within the focal trough the pinna of the ear um, epiglottis and posterior pharyngeal wall so that begins bring, brings uh, us to the interesting aspect of what are ghost images now that we've seen there are multiple soft tissue and uh, other structures which cast shadows it's important to understand that there are certain shadows which can be cast by the jaws itself because of reciprocal movement and the complex principle of panoramic radiography uh, ghosts are also cast by external objects like these earrings for example which have been left behind so you would notice something very interesting about these ghost shadows Number one is that the ghost image has the same morphology as the real counterpart. It appears higher up, blurred, and more blurred and vertically higher up, and larger and on the opposite side. Remember the x-ray machine and the receptor are rotating around the patient's head. So when this area has got exposed, it has created a ghost on the opposite side, which is larger, higher up, blurred, and uh, on the opposite side. So that is how the characteristics of ghost images appear. So that's why it's important that patient is advised to take away all jewelry that could obscure the uh, image area or most important area that has to be seen there is uh, uh, any necklaces or hairpins, earrings, nose rings, all of these have to be taken off external jewelry. But if the patient is wearing um, braces, for example, is something you cannot get rid of. And do they cast ghosts? Yes, they do. And what about FPDs? What about implants? Now, implants luckily don't really cause much of a ghost because they're within the bone structure. But uh, FPDs can be nasty and can cause a lot of ghosting. So that is inevitable and more and more newer panoramic machines have technology to get rid of the ghosting. But the older ones still do end up casting uh, slight radio opacities which are ghosts and can obscure your area of interest. Now, when I mean obscure your area of interest is this ghost is exactly superimposing over the apex of your upper left molar right molar and hence you know a uh, first quadrant and giving you a blurred area here <clears throat> 
So, with the latest advancements in imaging software, panoramic radiographs can be really interesting and you have various fun tools that can you be used. But essentially for diagnostic purpose, you rarely use most of the tools or all of the tools, but you do use them for patient education. They can be very useful in making the patient understand where the lesion is or where the pathology is or which tooth are we going to extract or what is the um, measurements of a particular area where the implant is going to be placed. So all in all, uh, the imaging softwares have uh, are, um, a very interesting interface and they allow you to uh, make adjustments to brightness, contrast, etc. as well as uh, viewing it in different uh, measurements and planes and uh, giving you an ideal method of imaging and a very impressive patient education platform. So you can see that the advantages of panoramic image are there. It has a broad area of coverage, relatively low patient radiation dose. We'll speak more about that. The typical effective dose is 9 to 26 microsieverts, which is almost just equal to that of a chest X-ray. It has convenience, multiple convenience. You can see all the teeth together and they are generally nowadays easily available in most urban and semi-urban areas and even rural healthcare setups. Uh, it can be of great relevance when the patient has trismus, unable to open the mouth due to trauma or other uh, conditions of the TMJ, and also useful in patient education. When it comes to radiation safety, what do we mean by relatively low patient radiation dose? When we compare it to a full mouth x-rays, for example, 14 to 20 films uh, taken, even let it be even an F-speed film or a PSP, is around 200 microsieverts if you use a round collimator. And when you compare that to one panoramic image, the typical effective dose is just 9 to 26 microsieverts, which in effect is almost equal to a 5-hour airline flight or 2.5 days of equivalent background radiation on Earth. So if you have understood what is radiation uh, biology and safety, you will understand what this comparison is about. This is equivalent radiation um, dosaging and the effective dose is just around 9 to 26 uh, microsieverts. Why is there a range? It depends on machine to machine and the area of e exposure. So what is important to understand is using good clinical judgment and applying evidence-based imaging guidelines. So just because we have all of these advantages in panoramic radiography, it doesn't mean we use it routinely to replace the uh, intraoral periapical radiographs. Uh, it's important to read through and understand best Im imaging practices uh, of uh, imaging as well as protection. So, if you were to look at the uses or indications of panoramic radiography, most important ones are bony lesions, unerupted teeth, we use it for assessment of wisdom teeth prior to surgical intervention, grossly neglected mouth to assess periodontal bone support when the pocket depth is greater than 6 mm, orthodontic assessment, very essential tool, fractures of mandible, antral disease, that means diseases of the sinuses, especially the maxillary sinus, the floor, posterior and median walls are clearly visible. Destructive diseases of articular surface of the TMJ when you have to do gross evaluation and uh, not for minor evaluation or, uh, micro or uh, very detailed evaluation is for gross pathology evaluation and also for pre-implant planning when you want to assess the um, vertical alveolar bone height. And um, these are my references and uh, thank you very much.